Hello, welcome to the Lee Cole 3 podcast. I am here with my partner and friend, James Proctor, and we have a very special guest today, Sandra Petty. And Sandra Petty is uh, the author of the book, Sunny, about Sonny Francis. And uh, she did a very thorough job, and we're going to ask her, uh, we're going to interview about the book, about a very interesting character. How you doing, Sandra? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Well, it's it's a pleasure. And uh, I'd like to start this off by asking you, tell us something about you before we get into Sonny. Well, I can tell you, I'm not very interesting. Sonny is, but I'm not. I'm just a journalist. I'm an investigative journalist. And I go where the stories take me. And Sonny is a great story. I couldn't let it go. Let me ask you a question. You're sitting down one day. And then did it just pop in your head and did you see, did you see like an article about Sonny? How did it come to you out of all people to go to interview Sonny? No, it, it's, it's not a matter of sitting around and having brilliant ideas because I'm not brilliant. <laughs> uh, what happened was I was working on another project and Michael Francis was coming to Long Island to give a sermon. And I needed to know about the mafia. I work uh, on Long Island, New York, and I needed to know about the mafia in the 1990s on Long Island. And he was a good guy to talk to about that. So I interviewed him. And at the end of the interview, he said, yeah, at the end of this, I'm going to go up to Devons, Massachusetts and visit, visit my dad. He's 100 years old and he's the oldest inmate in the federal prison system. And knowing Michael, as I do now, he was just dangling a shiny object in front of me because he knew any reporter would jump at it. And of course yeah. I did. I realized that's a great story. I got to interview this guy. Did and you have was, any idea what you were getting into? No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. And so tell us about what was the first time you met Sonny? Well, I, I was there when he got out of prison, although I didn't meet him officially. Actually, uh, they were, he was at the time 101 years old and he was, he had gotten very sick and he did not respond to letters. His family uh, wasn't cooperating and Michael doesn't have a great relationship with his other siblings. So he didn't know. So he went up to the prison, got there at six o'clock in the morning and had to park across the street because their, their federal prisons are very, very tough they, they, in terms of security. Yeah. And we didn't know what car he was driving. So we would look for New York plates and I had a platter of Italian cookies. And I, of course, got dressed and I got my nails done because I had never met a mob boss before. So I thought I should at least get my nails done. And I got my cookies and I was literally running up to every car with New York plates and the cookies. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and finally, about one o'clock, we see a car, car that looks he looks looks like it's him. And these two guys with this older man who was very thin. And the last picture I had seen of Sonny, he had gotten he was always very fit. He was always very athletic. But you know, in his 90s, he got a little porky. And so this man was very thin. So we stopped the car and I say, these cookies are for Sonny. And the two men in the front seat say, no, 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 it's not Sonny. It's not Sonny. <laughs> and I said, are you sure? And the man in the back seat, you know, are you sure? The man in the back seat starts to jump. And I said, well, okay, I, I guess it's not Sonny, but we took the picture anyway. And then we sent it to Michael and he confirmed it was Sonny. Now, the reason I tell this story is this was in 2017. So in 2021, when I'm writing the book, I'm doing more research and I call up this old family friend whom I, I know knows the family really well. And I said, would you do an interview? And he goes, no, no, I want nothing to do with this. Forget it. I, I, no, no, no. And, you know, all these guys talk at the same decibel, which is very loud. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Okay. A year later, I get an email from him and he says, I read your book. It's fabulous. You got everything right. I hope you sell, sell a million copies. And P.S. I'm the guy who was driving the car when you brought the cookies to Sunny. Wow. Oh my god. Never gosh. know. <laughs> and, and did you uh when you started going into Sonny's life, okay, very handsome, rugged type of guy. Uh he personified when you looked at him, it's not like you had to say to yourself, 
is he a gangster? No, not he not looked at all. like a gangster. Yeah. He was like John Gotti. There's a there's some guys that have that look of a gangster. Uh, the more you read on him, did you were you like fascinated and said, "Wow, I mean, this guy was actually a big star before John Gotti was even born." Well, absolutely. He had this amazing life and he, he was involved in the music industry and in movies and crime throughout New York, throughout the country. And yet his life was marked by great tragedy as well. It was Shakespearean in yeah. its scope. And it was the kind of story that hadn't been told before. And I thought, I got to tell this story. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And this is a picture of him to give you an yes. idea. It looked like he was working out there. Was he a fit guy that worked out? He he was always fit. He worked out in, in prison. He was the um, handball champion when he was in federal prison. And even when he was in the nursing home, he told me, yeah, I do squats every morning. And, you know, I, I uh, try to walk and I'm going to walk again. And he, I mean, he was always very focused on fitness. Unlike many of his confederates, he wasn't a big drinker. He, right. you know, he maybe had a glass of wine with dinner, but that's about it. He didn't smoke. And it, it was funny. He told me how he swore off sugar when he was in the army. And when I met him for the first time in the nursing home, I again brought a platter of cookies. And he was telling me how he never ate sugar. And I said, oh, geez, the Sonny, did I do something wrong? You know, I'm bringing the cookies. He goes, oh, no, I'll take the cookies. <laughs> so, uh, and he was a big eater. You know, one of the things that... Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the first interview, the the uh, nursing home attendant brought him lunch, which was rice and you know, steamed vegetables and you know something really bland and healthy. And he just slapped it and he said, "Ugh, I can't stand this food." And I said, "Well, you know, what do you want? We'll bring you lunch the next time we come back." And he looks at me. He said, "You bring me lunch?" I said, "Yeah. What do you want?" And I'm thinking Italian, so I'm thinking, well, you know, penne alla vodka, shrimp scampi. Well, you know, I'm thinking very waspy Italian dishes. And he goes, "Pasta fazool? Can you bring me pasta fazool?" <laughs> Which is an old time traditional yeah. Italian dish, obviously. Well, when he was coming up in the city, it was pretty easy to find a place that made pasta fazool. His nursing home was in Queens. There was one place that made pasta fazool. We call every Italian place, every deli in the area, and we found one place. And as it turned out, the owner was from Naples, which is where Sonny was from. And so every time I'd bring him uh, pasta fazool. Did you, you tell know, him? You, did you tell him that you? I'm sorry. Uh, did you tell him that you were picking it up for Sonny? No, no. I should have. <laughs> I should have. You're right. What did you want to ask her, James? I'm sorry. No, no. I was just going to say that you're very smart because uh, you knew the way to get to Sonny's heart. You know, for a, a mobster, the way to a mobster's heart is through their stomach. So you did the right <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, I mean, I think most people appreciate food. And at one point, yeah, it, it was our second interview and he had brought and all he, he had invited. Well, a bunch of his guys had just decided to show up and yep. So we got a lot of food. We got, you know, meatball, Parmesan uh, heroes and yeah. pizza with pepperoni and all sorts of stuff. And I'm sitting next to Sonny and we're all eating and I have a slice of pizza and he looks over at my dish. He goes, what, what do you got there? I said, pizza. You want a slice? He goes, yeah, I want a slice. So he's eating off my plate. You know, he had a uh -huh. prodigious appetite. He really did. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, do it, there's a short video. It's about three, three, three and a half minutes. I'm going to play it. And then we're going to get back into to Sonny. But I think that this kind of gives us uh, uh, a way to get a feeling about what you, what, how, how close you were to him with your interviews and stuff, because you're in this video too. So I'm going to put this up and. Uh... I haven't seen this video. What was it like wearing the wire? around your father. What was it like testifying against him? And now you're out of witness yeah. security. You know they want to kill you, right? Sonny Franzis, in and out of jail most of his life, was the underboss or the number two guy in the Colombo crime family. He was almost a mythic figure in the world of organized crime. Unlike a John Gotti, Sonny Franzis did his business quietly John Gotti was the shadow of Sonny Francis. He was a committed, wise guy. 
this was his master's degree, this getting made. Uh, they would discuss him a lot on these tapes. Things like, he's going to outlive us all. And now look, he's 100. Gotti would say the most ridiculous thing. Do you guys ever hear of Sonny Francis? Tough guy. Sonny Francis. Tough guy. He'd say it different ways, like 20 times. He really, really respected Sonny Francis. We're doing this documentary on the Francis family. Stop it, I won't. I just promised I would never, ever, ever do that. Nobody wants any part of that whole thing. Just so that you know, that includes me because I'm not going to do anything that's going against what they want, you know? By default, my dad became less and less of a figure in the house. You know, I was young. I was doing the best I could, but, you know, I, I was like taking care of my brothers and sisters with my mother. You know, you can't lose a father in the house, especially somebody that was so dominant like that. His own son, the bastard, excuse me, John Jr., he drove his father around, his father would have a sit down in the back seat of the car, and that kid was wired. Uh, you know, I was kind of hoping this would all go away because, uh, first of all, can I speak to you off yes. the record? Yes, yes. I remember it was a Little League game. I ran really hard to first base. I grounded out. I don't think I got a hit all year. And he saw me dejected. My father showed up, not Sonny Francis. He came over to me and he said, hey, son, what are you upset about? He said, don't worry about it. You'll get better. He says, the way you hustle down there, I'm proud of you, son. There was a part of that in him that was really good. Sandra, get ready. And that's the guy in the New York place. Is it? Yep. These are, these are for Sonny. Do you have Sonny Francis? You don't have him? Okay. Well, what about John Jr.? Can't answer that. Yeah. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe all the drugs he took screwed his mind up. Listen, it broke my heart. He would be the last guy I thought would do that. This is for Rapallo. This is for Ernie I never knew that, son of a gun. So you didn't order him hit? I didn't even know the guy. I never met him. You could have saved yourself 50 years in prison. But then I couldn't live with myself. You're on mute. What did you think of that? And, you know, I have seen it before. It was a trailer to a documentary we did, and it's it it brings back a lot of memories. I spent a and lot. That of was you. That was you at the car when when yeah was with the cookies with the cookies. <laughs> I like that a lot. I never seen it. And of course, <laughs> James found it uh, showing off. But, um, and uh, it brings back, uh, when I see that, I say to myself, here you got his son. He seemed like he was so heartbroken that his son did that to him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He never got over that, did he? No. And it, John, um, later in life, after, after my first story ran about Sonny, getting out of prison, uh, someone said, I know where John Francis is because he was in witness protection. And I know what his name is, which was Matt Pazzarelli. And the um, federal marshals wanted to move him because they move you right away. And you get no notice, you're moved. And they called him up. They said, we got to move you because your identity is out. And John had been thinking about getting out of witness protection because he had... Um, throat dysplasia you know he has hiv right. and he thought he was gonna die before seeing his family again and so he wanted to see his family so he signed himself out of witness protection and a friend had some frequent flyer miles and she flew him she flew with him to new york to visit his father and sonny didn't recognize him right away because he had lost a lot of weight john had lost a lot of weight and then he asked him, he said, why did you do it? He said, why did you write that letter? Because he couldn't bring himself to say, why did you testify? Mm -hmm. And John said, well, dad, I wasn't testifying against you. I was testifying against the life. And Sonny said, well, you're my son. You've always been crazy and I still love you. So in the end, he forgave John. Yeah. Well, that's a, you know, here's the thing that, that really bothers me about the whole thing is, he 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 ratted on his father when he was in his nineties. Is that correct? Yes. So he yeah. basically was under the assumption his father was going to die in prison. 
Yes. Yes. That's, Everybody thought that. That's and weird. he had it on wire too. He was wired up, right? Right. So right. right. And he wasn't work. if you look at the transcripts, he wasn't he was wearing a wire not just against his father, but his uncle, his cousins, you know, and his father was trying to get him made. He was trying to get him made as a good yep. fella because here he was knowing Sonny knew he was not going to live much longer and he wanted to make sure John was taken care of. Mm -hmm. And even though, and that's the only reason Sonny talked to John the way he did, because he really didn't say much that was incriminating, but, but a couple of things around John. And, um, that's what did him in. It was his love for his son. He wanted to set up his son for life. Now, James, did you want to follow up with something on this? Yeah, yeah. So just wanted to mention, you know, what I appreciate about um, about you and the research you did was, you know, you interviewed over 130 people, mm -hmm. you know, for this book. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Sonny would tell people he was, 104, but you know, he's really 103. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you had six extensive conversations with Sonny. And so, you know, you ended up um, relying, obviously, on court testimonies, transcripts and all that. But then you were having to reach out to people that, you know, we're trying to recall events that were 40, 50, 60 yeah. plus years yeah. ago. And yeah. so, you know, I appreciate what you did, you know, all the research and hours that you spent, but, you know, I'm just, you know, curious, you know, all of these interviews that you, you had, um, was there some people that you really like speaking with? Uh, I'm sure some people didn't want to talk to you. Others would, others I know would, would call Sonny first, but were there any favorite people that really helped you to understand who Sonny was in addition to obviously your interview with Sonny? You know, that's such an interesting question. One of my favorites was his former daughter-in-law, Roberta. And there's a clip in that video that you showed where there's this mm -hmm. basement that's filled with all this stuff. That's the basement of her house where they stored a lot of things because she took Tina in at the end of her life. And right. Berta really had an interesting perspective. And, and I should say, um, that's Tina just, that, yes, that's Tina. Um, I was trying to get people to talk to me about events 40 and 50 years earlier. And some of cops would complain. They'd say, Oh, Sandra, you're asking me about, you know, something that happened 40 or 50 years ago. And I'd say, Oh, please. It's better. You're better off than the alternative. You're not dead and you're lucid. So talk, you know? Yeah. And so eventually they would. And everybody knew that when they were dealing with Sonny, they were dealing with someone very unusual. And one of the things that you learn as a researcher, when you call people, they're going to call your target and they're going to say, yeah. you know, this reporter is calling about me. And mm -hmm. Sonny never told them not to talk to me. Wow. Had he told them not to talk to me, he would have shut it down right away. Yeah. yeah. But he yeah. never said, don't talk. When you wow. talk to the cops uh, or law people that were involved uh, with stuff with him, what was their opinion of Sonny? Oh, to a man, and it was all men, um, they respected him. They respected his, his toughness, his adherence to the code. Uh, they, and you know, he was always very polite and professional whenever he was arrested. He wasn't one of these guys who acted crazy and they respected that. So that's one of the things that was very striking. One of the things that I discovered early on that was amazing to me is across the board, street guys and law enforcement had this deep respect for Sonny and still do. Yeah. It's amazing. It's same in the mob genre. It's like when you're talking about people, you mentioned Sonny, you don't ever hear anything bad about Sonny. You'll hear bad things about John Gotti, about even upstanding guys like Gotti or whoever. You'll hear bad things, that negative, right down the middle. But you don't get that middle with Sonny. It's like whether – it was like he was they, – they treated him like a, like a legend but a good legend, yeah. even though we know he was a brutal murderer. Well, he he was a pretty good politician when you think about it. And had he been born into a different life, he would have been the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. 
He let yep. the guys under him make money. You know, some yep. of these bosses don't. Some of these bosses are pretty greedy, like uh, Paul Castellano. Yeah. For example. Yeah. And uh, but Sonny always made sure his guys could make money. Yeah, they had to kick up to him, but he didn't mm -hmm. suck everything out of them. Yeah, and he got and John Gotti always said he was tough, tough. And John Gotti, you, you had to earn something from him. Here's a question. I'm, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but I'm just going to go there. What yeah. did Sonny think of John Gotti? He well, you know, he did authorize a hit on John Gotti Jr. Sonny did. Yes. Sonny did. And so he, uh, I did not ask him what he thought of John Gotti. So I don't know, but I do know he authorized a hit on his son. So it tells you something about how he felt. He felt he was talking too much, that he had left the life. And I don't know who asked to do it, but he did authorize it. And what happened of that? Did they? Did well, they... he's still alive. So obviously, you know, it, it, it didn't happen. And that's actually another line of inquiry that I should chase down because I don't know the answer to that. Well, you know something, when uh, Angel Gotti sees this, she's going to bring it up. I guarantee it. <laughs> well, I would sure love to know more about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, because uh, there's a lot of things said out there that a lot of people just don't know with these guys, what goes on behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. 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 Now I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna get into. Uh, I'm sorry. You were about to say something, James? No, no. Uh, kind of related to this was the and, and I know you're going to ask saying uh, Lee, but uh, earlier you had mentioned that you'd met with um, Sonny, and then a group of friends came. And I know in the book what you said was that you know you saw a different side of of Sonny where he was uh, basically telling uh, vulgar stories mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and all that stuff and. I guess using colorful language. And so yes. you were uh, not offended by it. And so I was just curious uh, if you could say who were the people, who were those group of people that came? You know, one of them is in the video, Tony Knapp, who's now dead. He is the son of a, a former Jimmy Knapp, who was a capo, I think, in the Genovese family. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of street guys or Tommy Gallagher. He's also in the video. He's a retired boxing trainer and a few other, you know, guys just off the street who knew Sonny. Okay. Who, um, and, you know, they just kind of wanted hardcore to street guys, street gangsters came to see him basically. Oh, sure. Tony sure. Knapp was Gallagher. You're talking about these were street guys from New York. Yeah. Oh, yep. sure. Sure. Yeah, a lot yeah, of them. Yeah. And he and he at one point complained to me, too many people come to see him, you know, but he always had time for me. So I have to give him credit for that. But he he was and everybody knew who he was in the nursing home. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now we're going to get into another part of Sonny. Sonny, what was Sonny's reputation with the women? Well, he was uh, quite a ladies man. And we're going to get into, I'm going to put a picture up first and we could start off from there, but because who's better to start off with than Ava Gardner? Yeah. Yeah. Now she, uh, he did not, he was one of the few women uh, he didn't claim to have gone to bed with. He did make out with her at the Copacabana while her boyfriend, Frank Sinatra was performing on stage. And he went into great detail about <laughs> the session. Um, and I think, a lot of that had to do with he he had to assert dominance over Frank Sinatra. He met F Frank Sinatra when he was a skinny kid singing on a stage in the Catskills. And he, Sinatra got into a fight and Sonny jumped in and helped him out. Sonny was really, when he met Sinatra, he was the dominant guy. And of course, Sinatra became huge and had a huge ego. And he would call to Sonny when he saw him in the Copacabana, but Sonny wouldn't turn around because he didn't want Sinatra to think that uh, he had the edge over him. So I think the makeout session with Ava Gardner was just a way of asserting his dominance over yeah, Frank. Power, he, a power move. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It was a power yeah. move. But he, but he also, he had affairs with Jane Mansfield, Marilyn Monroe, Dagmar, uh, Dionne Warwick, Diane Carroll. And that's just a few. Um, and, and, I, you know, a couple of men I know who read the book, they didn't believe it. They thought he was mm. boasting. But I did not get these stories all from Sonny. I got some of these stories from his friends. And one of his friends, Tommy Gallagher, I remember him just shaking his head and saying, the guy was a magnet. It was unbelievable. Mm. Oh, and they all, 
They all talked about him like that. They said it was just, they said women would come up to him. And even yeah. Sonny admitted it. He said, I, I didn't really understand it because I didn't think I was that good looking, but he was, he was swarmed by women and of all types. And there was, I, I don't know if I should repeat this. Oh, I'll repeat it. Um, it's not in the book. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has at least one illegitimate son and he has potentially two others. And one who thought he was his illegitimate son because his mother had an affair with Sonny. He got a blood test and it turns out he's not his illegitimate son, but he knows that his mother had an affair. Mm -hmm. um, and the family believes that, well, again, I'm, I'm not, this is just a rumor, just a rumor. Yep. Oh, I like uh, rumors, rumors are great. Yeah. <laughs> that that Sylvester Stallone may have a connection to Sonny, that his mother may have been involved with Sonny. And there are pictures that I have of Sylvester Stallone, a very young Sylvester Stallone at the Francis house on Long Island. Wow, wow those would be some interesting blood tests to take. <laughs> 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 and and the mother was a she was a wild she was a wild child so uh, I, I I you know I don't know I just know that and uh, I have run it by a couple of family members and some think it's just a crazy rumor but others believe it. Well, you get mythical rumors with these beloved gangsters. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, did you feel like a lot of did you feel like a lot of the stuff you were hearing was mythical tales about Sonny or did you feel like most of the stuff you heard about Sonny was true? You know, well, first of all, I checked everything. I corroborated everything. Mm -hmm. Everything I could check against records, I did, you know. And Sonny did not lie to me. There were certain things he wouldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, he wouldn't talk about murder because there's no statute of limitations on murder. And he was also really nervous to, talking about money because he was terrified of the IRS. Absolutely yeah. terrified. Yeah. Um, but n there was a sense that people kind of knew that this was going to be the record of his life. Mm -hmm. And it, they kind of knew that they were doing something special when they were talking about Sonny. So they told me the truth. And, you know, I, I would be very careful about pushing back, saying, are you sure? And so forth. And I didn't include anything. Like the Sylvester Stallone rumor, that's not in the book. It's a sure. rumor. Yeah, um, you right. couldn't substantiate yeah. it. Yeah. Right, right. And Sonny and Sylvester Roy might come out and say, how dare you say that I'm related to him? <laughs> uh, where most that. people would be like, really? That's my dad? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's right. what it is. The, the one son uh, who is confirmed, who's illegitimate, he doesn't want to know. that. Uh, yeah. So. How about, what did he think of Carmine Persico? They had a very tense relationship, even though the family socialized and, you know, they would have dinner at each other's houses. And John, when he talks about going over to the Persico house, he remembers thinking it was so different because they actually asked, the Perscos actually asked their children how their day was and how they did. You know, at home in the Francis household, Tina was pretty tough. You know, there was a lot mm -hmm. of yelling and a lot of screaming, but there was real tension over the years. And Sonny's mistress, Gina Lynch, saw it while they were in prison together. Sonny seemed to believe that Persico um, ratted him up, but there's no proof of that anywhere uh, at all. Exactly. Right. But he does believe that Persico killed his driver. He did believe. I shouldn't say does. He's no longer he, with us. And he killed uh, Sonny's driver? Yeah. And he was, yeah. he was pretty broken up about that. But now, when the war broke out, the Colombo War. Which war? Uh, the first one or the second one? Uh, the one, uh, the second one was when Sonny stood behind Persico. Uh, the the last war, actually. With yeah, uh, yeah, he said it was Persico over Arena. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what, you throw that stuff out like you just know it like nothing. Now. Isn't, isn't it amazing <laughs> when you start learning this stuff? It, 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 it's just. When it seems to me, did you ever think you'd see the day where you'd be able to sit here and spit that right out to me? <laughs> no, and bear in mind, I grew up in Minnesota. I didn't even know there was a mafia until I saw The Godfather. <laughs> you know, this is crazy. My mother would be, if she were alive, she'd be shaking her head saying, oh, my goodness. You know. Now, he didn't want his sons killed during that war. Is that right? 
Yeah, he was worried about that. And John went to go see him in prison and said, what do I do? And so they were trying to strategize, uh, but he was also kind of fatalistic about it. He was, Sonny mm. knew that certain things would happen in that life. And there were certain things he, he, and he told him, I can't protect you while I'm in prison. Although he did have a lot of juice in prison and he ran his businesses while he was in prison. He still made money. You know, there. I, this is another element. You guys are getting a lot out of me. I, um, <laughs> I did not put in the book. Um, he was a consultant on The Godfather and got payments while in prison. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. And, Did and you he, see the offer? The, the I have the not series? seen it, and people yeah. keep telling me to, so I have to yeah. see it. But when I say yeah. Tony Knapps, I said, well, what would you, what'd you do on the, the Godfather? And Tony Knapps said he was a consultant. So in other words, <laughs> he had to get – because, you know, they – they were um, the Columbus were disrupting filming and they had yeah. to uh, pay to film. And Sonny was one of the people who got paid. And Joe Colombo was actually a consultant, too. Is that correct? In the yes. Well, yes. It, it, yes. It, it, but Sonny was in. But my point is he was in prison and he was still getting the yeah. money. So. And so what was his. Uh, did he ever tell you what he thought of Joe Colombo? He he and Joe Colombo were close. They worked well together. Um he was careful about mentioning other guys' names because he didn't want to implicate anyone, but Colombo and Sonny were close. They did a lot of business. Yeah. It's what happened though with, um, so about Colombo, you know, and that's something that we know, you know, that he, he helped him with the, you know, they had the Profoxy, um, you know, Joe Profoxy had gotten, uh, had died and then, um, you know, eventually Colombo is is made boss, and and so, and then that's when Sonny became a capo, right? Right. And so, what happened though later in the in the sixties? So, you know, it seemed to me there might have been a falling out or something because you'd mentioned in the book that uh, Sonny was kept away from the from a Christmas party and also Joe Colombo Jr.'s uh, wedding. Was that right. just because of the heat that Sonny was on, or was it? Because yes. there was some sort of issue. Well, it, and that's a, a very astute point. It was because he had four indictments in a single year, yeah. and they were very they were highly publicized. So he was bringing a lot of publicity to mm -hmm. the mafia, which they don't like. You know, that's that's and that's a perfect uh, clip to 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 uh, throw up. Yeah. And so he did not like the fact that Sonny was bringing so much heat on everyone, and. Um, it was a source of pain for Sonny. It really was. Uh, but I'm not aware of anything else other than that, that, that it was just a problem. He was too high profile. And if you note, the mafia is still around. People always ask me, is the mafia yeah, still around? Yeah. Of course it's still around. Yeah. But if you notice, it's much lower key. Yes. You don't see the big flashy guys like John. You don't Dottie. see the murders anymore. Or... Right, right. Well, yeah. there are murders, but you just yeah, don't. Are. Very hear. low. Yeah. And yeah. and so they've they've clearly decided that they're going that they're going to keep it on the down low as much as possible. But it's what? ironic though because of the um, you know Joe Colombo had the you know the Italian American Association right. and so right. he's out there and that's ticking off the other bosses and everything and you know that led to him getting you know killed you know shot and then later died and so. It's just ironic that, you know, he didn't want him to come to the Christmas party or, or or his son's wedding, but he was really high profile himself. You know, that's a, I've never I've never heard anyone put it that way. That's a yeah. really perceptive point. That's that's really, really good. You're absolutely Thank right. You. But these these guys, you know, it's never uh, they always think if they do it, it's OK. If someone else mm -hmm. does it, it's not OK. Yeah. But if they do it, yeah. oh, I, they, oh, I, you know, I'm fine. You know, yeah. I think one of the things Sonny was guilty of is looking like a gangster. And 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 yep. the press took up on that. It was like you look like a gangster. You fit that, you know, like John Gotti. You fit that role. So the yeah. press well, is going to be all over that person. Well, you know, yes, you're right. He absolutely had that look, and he had that look till the end of his days. But he didn't dress the way some of these other slobs dress. You know, look at these guys. You yeah. know, they're in these sloppy, you know, gym suits and track suits and gold chains and all this stuff. 
And mm-hmm. Sonny said to me at one point, he said, I knew how to, to dress. A lot of guys didn't. And he said, and that was, I knew I always wore cashmere and that's when cashmere was expensive. Oh yeah. And he would wear French cuffs and, you know, he was a very, uh, very classy dresser, not flashy, but classy. Mm-hmm. And um, that was one of the other things. He, he was a good looking guy. He did look like a gangster, but he, and the other thing, and this was very striking to me because I, I looked through hundreds of old photos of gangsters. And yep. when you see them in the perp walks, they always cover their face. Sonny, yep. Sonny never covered his face. Yeah, there's and a I, big picture of Carmine Persico that where he's covering his face that was in the book. That was kind of what most of these gangsters would do. And and Sonny wouldn't do that. You know, he, he took pride and, you know, he wasn't going to hide his face. And, and right. you know, it's, it's funny when you say that, because I think once again of John Gotti. Yes. These are guys that, hey, here's what I am. This is who I yeah. am. And I don't care what you think about it. You know, it's it's absolutely true. At one point, Sonny was telling me he was telling me about the clubs. You know, he got out of the army and he was opening up restaurants and clubs. And he said, but I couldn't get a liquor license. I, you know, I like a dope say, well, why couldn't you get a liquor license? And he looked at me and he said, because I was a bad guy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know. And when you say bad guy, did did Sonny ever try to say that? Okay, the, the, one of the famous lines gangsters use is, I never killed nobody that didn't have it coming. But unfortunately, gangsters are the judges of who has it coming. So did you get that feeling from uh, that he, that was that his line that he would use? Well, he said, I never killed nobody that was innocent. And, you know, you're sitting there thinking, well, okay, Sonny, but who made you God? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just... Um, and Somebody yeah. hit your car with a golf ball, they're not innocent. I mean, little <laughs> things like that. There, yeah. And he did... He did kill women, and we don't know all the people. Oh, he did. Wow. What is some of those stories, or maybe a story of some of the so-called people maybe outside the life that was women or whatever? Well, for example, there was in 1959, um, Anthony Carfano, he was a capo in the Genovese uh, crime family, and he didn't yep. like he didn't like Vito Genovese, and he would get drunk and talk. He would say stupid uh. things about the bosses. And so he wasn't well liked, and he, he was also known as Little Augie Pisano. But in any case, he was uh, at an Italian restaurant in Manhattan. I think it was Mario's, and mm-hmm. he got a phone call. They brought him a f- to the phone, and they said he had to get off. And he said, "I gotta go." Mm-hmm. And he was with Janice Drake, who was married to a comedian, Alan Drake, and she was a former beauty. Queen. I did a video on Janice Drake, the killing. Uh, oh, wow. okay. So, and that's actually, I was hoping her son died a few years ago. I was thinking about doing a book about that case because I think that's wow. a really interesting case. But in any case, their bodies were found by Kennedy in, in a car, um, yeah. shot to death by uh, by Kennedy Airport. And wow. Sonny Francis was believed to have been one of the last three men to see them alive. He was never charged, but the Queen's DA was convinced that he was behind that killing. It's so she could have been someone who was a completely innocent bystander, and she just right. happened to be there. It's funny you said that, because I, I'm one of the few people here that did a story on it, because I found her killing very, it was different. You yeah. Know, an innocent I agree. woman, wrong place at the wrong time. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with you. Because when I investigated that murder... In the beginning, they were like, okay, why did this happen? But they came to the conclusion she just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, sad story, but, you know, uh, her career was just starting off, too. So. Yeah, yeah. She was I a mean, young woman, young woman with a young child. You know, it was very sad. So when, how many people do you think, if you, or even maybe Sonny said he was involved in killing? Well, authorities at the time in the 60s said it was between 40 and 50, which seems a little high to me. But he was caught on tape saying, I killed a lot of guys and we're not talking 8, 9, 10. Okay. So I, I think it's probably somewhere between a dozen and 50 people. I think it's yeah. a lot of people. And remember, Sonny died at the age of 103. He mm-hmm. lived a long life and he was made when he was 14 years old and wow. he got made because of, he killed someone as a favorite yep. Gambino. 
And so when you think about that, that's a lot of time to kill people. Yeah. What about with Carlo Gambino? And that that's an it. You know, I was, I was reading a few things about him in the book. And so, you know, I see where Sonny had, was friendly with um, Albert Anastasia and, and yes. Vito Genovese, but uh, and also Joe Pervacci. But yes. what happened with Carlo Gambino? Because it seems like they didn't get along and there was some sort of issue there. And, and I, I love the story, if you want to repeat it, where he, he kind of put the fear of God in Carlo Gambino by just reaching for a Kleenex. Well, Sonny uh, had some allergies, and so he, he always had tissues in the breast pocket of his jacket. And yeah. he and Carlo Gambino and some other guys were at a sit down, which, of course, is a very serious meeting. That's where you're discussing, yeah. you know, who's going to live or die. And Sonny reached into his pocket for a tissue, and mm -hmm. Carlo Gambino dove under a table. And <laughs> Sonny stood there dumbfounded. He didn't say a word. And nobody, nobody said anything. But afterwards, he told John, who was the one who related the story to me, he said, that guy ain't got shit. <laughs> and Carlo Gambino never forgot it because he was humiliated in front of high-ranking guys. Okay. And so Sonny believed that Carlo Gambino was the person behind the bank robbers who authorized... Sonny was convicted of bank robbery conspiracy in 1967. Yeah. It was based on the testimony of this motley crew of four bank robbers. Right. And Sonny and others believe that Carlo Gambino was the one who authorized them to testify against Sonny. And, and, these was guys, and these four guys that said that he was, he, did they say that he was involved with them? And yeah, he said he was involved in the planning. He showed them maps. He um, he directed them, and he certainly got a cut of the proceeds. And did did these guys come off as guys that he would even work with? Well, that's a very good question, and I, there are many, many people who know Sonny who say he never would have associated with these guys. He would have had middlemen dealing with them. Yeah, um, but. You know, they they did talk about how he got frustrated after one bank robbery that they screwed up. They decided to uh, fly to Denver to rob a bank there because they figured the U.S. Mint was there. So they thought they'd get a lot yeah. of money yeah. and they overslept and they had to take a later plane. And so they couldn't rob the bank until the next day and didn't realize, oh, banks are closed on Saturday. So, oh, so they had a lot of screw ups. They actually spent more money than they got that trip. Mm -hmm. And so they alleged that Sonny talked to them directly and said, okay, no more screw ups. This is what you're going to do. And so, you know, so, they, actually, so they literally gave him, how many years did they give him for the conspiracy? He was sentenced to 50 years in prison and it, the judge, Jacob Mishler, who sentenced him became Sonny's lifelong enemy. I mean, mm. if Sonny could have killed Jacob Mishler, he would have. And Mishler knew exactly what he was doing because he 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 made it so that he he had to serve up to 50 years. If he cooperated, he could get out early but he never mm -hmm. cooperated. And FBI agents went to prison many times to try to get him to cooperate and he never did. So you got guys here killing people, getting 20 years, 25 years, and you got this guy conspiracy to uh, commit bank robberies, getting uh, 50 years. That, that's a good point. It's a good comparison. And he never set foot in any of those banks that were robbed. And this was before RICO. I mean, it, it wasn't yes. like they could even yeah. use a RICO charge. It yeah. was a conspiracy charge. It, it, it's unheard of. Yeah. yeah. Was anybody ever sentenced to 50 years on a conspiracy to bank robbery? Well, that's a good point. Uh, I'd have to do a lot of research to know if it was the only one, but it certainly was unusual. If not unique, it was highly unusual. And then we see this newspaper article right here. It says FBI nabs Francis as super Dillinger. Huh. Right, right. I mean, it sounds that sounds like something that the feds would come and say, can you please put this article up? I got a good article for you. You know, it, it, it's... Well, you're right. Bob Green, who was the star investigative reporter at Newsday, was very close to law enforcement. He had worked on several committees that investigated organized crime. 
And they, they encouraged him to do these stories. And his own family was threatened as a result of the stories that he wrote about organized crime. But he did have a particular fascination with Sonny Francis. Mm. wrote a lot of stories about him. How many years did Sonny actually do for that bank robbery? Well, he did, uh, he did in total between the, the first sentence and the second sentence after John uh, testified against him about 28 years. He did about 23 years on the bank robbery because what happens in the federal system as in the state system, you never do, as they say, the whole bid. Right. And they do that because they want to give you an incentive to behave in prison. And of course, Sonny was a model prisoner because, you know, people waited on him hand and foot, which, which by the way, I saw when he got released from prison. But um, they so he got paroled. He repeatedly got paroled. He got paroled five times. But Sonny being Sonny, he violated his parole five times mm -hmm. because uh, and the way he violated his parole was because he hung out with other felons. You know, he loved hanging out with his guys. And that is what really led to. <laughs> his marriage to Tina falling apart because she felt that he chose the life over his own family. Okay. And, and we're going to get into Tina now. Um, every man like Sonny seems to have this beautiful, crazy woman that are in love with. And uh, because it takes a beautiful, crazy woman to keep up with men like that. Uh, and, and when I think about this, I think of other gangsters with beautiful, crazy women they're married to. Uh, would you say that's pretty much right when you're describing his wife, Tina? Well, I can tell you this. Every man I ever uh, spoke to who knew Tina described her as crazy. They always say, oh, she was wacky. But I'll tell. But the other thing is she was smart. Her own family says she was smarter than Sonny. She was tough. She was ruthless. She was every bit a gangster, and she could go toe-to-toe -to -toe <laughs> with Sonny. And she was pr the one person in his life he couldn't tame. She was not afraid of him. And he loved that about her. He loved that she was not afraid of him. She also, unlike a lot of other mob wives, she could pass in civilized society. She was someone who could hold her own at the Copa Cabana, talking to celebrities, talking to uh, wealthy people. She was, she was uh, a very smart, engaging, and talented woman. Did she, she know that, exquisite, I'm sorry. Um, did she know that Sonny was running around with half of America or? Yes. And later in life, she told people she didn't care, but she did care. You know, I, I found um, when he was in prison in his 90s, after John testified him, against him, all these women wrote him love letters. I mean, wow. you know, yeah. <laughs> this is another thing that's not in the book. And they wrote him and the crazy love letters. I, uh, and um, she found them and she went nuts. She went nuts. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if, um, so a couple of things on Tina. So I know that when he went to prison uh, that he had one of his capos that was supposed to look after um, his businesses. This poor Michael was involved as in the life. It was right before. And so anyway, um the, the, the capo that was supposed to look after Sonny uh, basically was doing what he's supposed to do. But then my understanding is that he was given too much attention to Tina. And so it must be that Sonny is a jealous man. So they found this guy, this Colombo capo, uh, murdered with his genitals cut off and put in his mouth. So. Yes. Do we have any evidence that Tina was unfaithful to Sonny or was this just based upon jealousy? Oh, I don't, I, I have no indication that she was unfaithful to him. It was jealousy. But when they were separated later in life, she went to clubs with friends. She, she went out, but that was after they were separated. And mm -hmm. she was at that point in her fifties and still a very attractive woman, but you know, she wasn't a woman who was going to settle for anyone. You know, you God forbid if she had affairs. I mean, it shame on her. I mean, you know, only Sonny can. <laughs> right. And, and but she, know, she also had to be around a man of a certain stature. You know, she was dazzled by by Sonny's stature in the so world. So she spent she was like a lot of women dazzled by Sonny. Oh, yeah. Except that it, I, she 
Yes, dazzled by who he was, but she also lived with him day to day. And she, I mean, I read the FBI uh, files because they had bugs in the home and mm -hmm. she screamed at him constantly. She harangued him constantly. They did, he, did he scream him. back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They Was there him. any domestic abuse in that in that marriage? No, there was one Thanksgiving um, where, where Tina got mad at, at Sonny and she pulled out a knife and she brought it right up to his face as if she were going to, a big knife, as if she were about to mm. stab him. And he just looked at her, he smiled and he laughed. Mm. So she put the knife back and she walked away and nobody ever said another word about it. Well, that's wow. amazing. That's not so, the book either. <laughs> it's amazing because, you know, this is not the first guy like Sonny that I've heard of, but that have had wives, wives like that. And they don't pull that switch of like, if a, you know, his, these are men that will kill people. Oh, yeah. But yet he has that control not to snap on her, you know, physically. Oh, oh, well, and, you know, there was this moment when I was interviewing him where I asked about this loan shark who was a nephew of his. And I, I didn't know that he had been a nephew. And Sonny gave me this look that just bored into me. And I had heard of the of other people describe the look. It's, it's the visual equivalent of taking you by the neck and squeezing, right? Mm. So he gives me this look and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I better look as dumb as I feel because I just stepped on a landmine and I have no mm -hmm. idea why. And then he looked at me a few more seconds like that. His eyes had gotten really dark and he, a few more seconds. And then he just let go. It was as if he had released me. He decided that I had no idea what I was talking about, which was true. Wow. So he could turn it on, as you say, Lee, like that. And mm. But with Tina, he could keep it under control. Can you describe this picture to me? This is the picture. This is Sonny and Tina after Sonny was acquitted of murdering Ernie the Hawk Rapolo, who was a one eyed okay. hitman whose body was found in bloated body was found in Jamaica Bay in 1964. And Sonny was accused of ordering the hit. And the Queen's DA brought this very high profile case against him. It was so high profile, it was the subject of a Life magazine article. So they mm. had professional photographers. And this is the photo taken. Um, by the uh, photographer Bob Peterson uh, of Tina's reaction, she was just crying with relief. She she kept on saying, "He did it. He did it. He beat the case. He did it," because she and, was so terrified that he'd be convicted. Mm. And and did it seems like Sonny had his paparazzis before paparazzis were a big thing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. They followed him around all over the place, and when he. One, one time, I, I guess it was in, in the 1960s when he hadn't gone to prison yet, but he was charged and he was he had been held in jail and he was coming back from the jail and photographers were chasing him and he had Tina get out and open the garage door so that he could pull in because he just didn't want his picture taken like that. Wow. But the other thing you <laughs> notice in the pictures is you'll never see him in handcuffs because he's always covering the handcuffs with a jacket or a paper bag or something. He just refused to be uh, photographed in handcuffs. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Hey, folks, uh, one thing I was just going to say is uh, please um, like this video if you haven't and, and please subscribe if you hadn't. You know, we're on a march to 10,000 subscribers and we'd really appreciate um your support by either liking or subscribing and he did that because i'll do a whole video and unlike a lot of youtubers i will not say please sub to my channel or have yeah. something popping up down here going yeah. like this you know and that's one of my weaknesses thank you for doing that james yeah what was sonny's relationship with the paparazzis well, uh, he um, he knew that they were part of life. He did not fight it. Uh, I remember once he told, and I, I this may or may not be in the book, he was walking along with um, a songwriter and his wife uh, out of the um, Cassius Clay fight. That was when Muhammad Ali was known as Cassius Clay, and they were yeah. in Madison Square, or Times Square, I think. And they're walking down the street, and he turned to her, and he said, smile pretty, because they're going to take your picture. So he knew and he decided, hey, I'm just going to live with it. And what? And I, at one point I asked him, I said, Sonny, you never covered your face 
you never back down. I go, Why not? And he said, I just couldn't back down. Just couldn't. You know, when you see that John Gotti was like that, do you think that John Gotti maybe took that cue from Sonny? I don't know, uh, but he was like that. And John Gotti was very gracious with the press, I always thought. He, he handled himself very well, and he knew that that kind of publicity can bring you a lot of business, but it also can bring you a lot of headaches. And, yeah. and Sonny knew that, too. He didn't like that he was as well-known as he was because he knew it would make other guys jealous. And, you know, you work in a workplace and other people are jealous. Okay, they're jealous. You, in the mafia, it'll get you killed. Yeah. Yeah, but you, I was, yeah, go ahead. No, you go, no, James, you go. No, no, what I was going to, to ask about was, you know, kind of, re, you know, related to this. So we talk about the, you know, how Sonny became, you know, this larger than life figure. And so you can go back and, and you can, um, see that actually Sonny came from a family that was involved in the mafia in, in Naples. And so, you know, you have his father, Carmine the Lion, that was a baker, but was also involved in the early mafia. And so how much of a influence was Carmine, his father, on Sonny becoming the mobster he was? Was he more influenced by his father or was there other wise guys that really made Sonny who he was? Well, he was absolutely um, influenced by his father and he deeply admired his father. And his father didn't, you know, Sonny used to box as a kid in the neighborhood. And yeah. his, when his Sonny, when his father found out, he got mad. He said, nobody's, you're not going to, nobody else is going to hit you but me. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to let my son get beaten up by other people. His father was a huge uh, influence. His sponsor in the mafia was a guy named Buster Alloy, who was an old okay. time gangster. And he admired him. And, you know, Sonny spoke with great admiration about some of the old time gangsters, um, Dutch Schultz and, and uh, Vito Genovese, he, he admired. He thought he was a really tough guy and Albert Anastasia. So he looked up to that that life. And he saw, at one point I asked him about Omerta, you know, because remember, he never admitted that the mafia even existed, you know, he right. stuck to the code till the very end. So I said, you know, oh, Sonny, what about Omerta? And, he, and this was the one time and all the time that I talked to him that he, he pretended to be confused. He said, mm -hmm. Omerta, what are you talking about? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> and um, because Sonny was very lucid, he was sharp, he was funny. Yeah. He had no uh, cognitive issues at all. And did wow. he think that Albert Anastasia had a gangster's death? Well, that's a good question. I don't know what Sonny thought about that. But yeah, I would say being shot in a barber chair is kind of a gangster death. Yeah. As you're getting a shave in the in the barber chair. I just, I just did a story on the Rizzuto family. Uh, up, they're part of the, they run the mob up in Canada. And the father was in his 80s and got assassinated through a window while he was eating dinner. Yeah. And, and I said, wow, if, if anybody could say to him, how do you want to go? That would probably be it. You know, <laughs> you know, right. At, with his family at the table getting shot. <laughs> you know? uh, okay. So, okay. So we got that part. I want to ask you when you get, when you got into this, was there any point where you just wanted to walk away because you didn't like the direction it was going or did you get more pulled in? Well, as I was writing the book, I kept on getting more pulled in, but after the book came out, you know, I was threatened a few times. And so I wasn't so happy about wow. that. And that, but at that point there's no pulling out. And once I commit to a project, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to threaten you or, and then did you go the FBI or what was the, what was, I, I'm not going to, I know I'm not, you can't talk about those details, but was it, um, what I just want to know, what were, were they credible threats or was it just, um, yeah. nut cases? No, 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 no. They, they were people who wanted money. You know, they felt like, okay. They wanted, but you know, I sadly I have to explain to people: uh, books are not a way to make money. Mm -mm. 
Uh, you might make money if it get tr gets turned into a movie or a TV series, you know. Right. But it's and I'm glad we or go that you went there because I'm going to briefly discuss something. Uh, when I first talked to you on the phone, I uh, at without me even knowing this, um, I think I found someone to play Sonny for you. And um, I'm going to put the gentleman up right now because when I heard of Sonny, this is the first person I thought of, <laughs> Frank Grillo. <laughs> <laughs> and you you said to me uh uh there's some there might be some stuff behind the scenes going on there well i thought it was so funny i thought you someone had planted that with you because i've actually uh spoken to frank grillo he uh, has expressed some interest in the movie and the first thing he said to me was yeah i hope you didn't get anything wrong and i said nah I can footnote every line. And I then I heard my agent in the background laughing, saying, see, <laughs> I told you, I told you. Um, so, he, yeah, he has he's definitely expressed interest in it. So we'll see. Nope. And you're right. He's got the look and he's got the he's a great actor. He's a great, great actor. You know, you see him in certain roles. He adapts to the role so yeah. well. And yeah. I could see him adapting to the Sonny role because, one, he's rugged looking, handsome, uh, and he look, and he's a physical specimen that yes, he, he's yeah. athletic. Yeah, he's not like an actor that just wants to play the power part. I mean, no, he yeah. fits all those scenarios, and he looks like the type of guy. I mean, whether he's playing a gigolo or, I mean, the guy plays roles that yeah are so far in in between. I think that would really fit him. So if you're anybody watches this that is working on this, I don't think you can go wrong with uh, Grillo. Please don't make it somebody that you know. No Brad Pitt, you know, put somebody there that belongs <laughs> there. Don't have like, yeah, yeah. There's some that wouldn't work out. So what is, and I know you don't probably only discuss so much of this, but what is the uh, going on behind the scenes about making this man's life into a movie? Well, I, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of interest. I, I've learned that in Hollywood, they talk a lot and they yeah. they say a lot of nice things, but uh, there's no contract, um, uh -huh. nothing concrete, but there's interest. There's definite interest there. Um, for a while, there seemed to be kind of a bias against mob movies. Yeah. Um, uh, but and it took a Scorsese, I guess, eight years to get The Irishman made. But, you mm -hmm. know, that was a huge, epic, brilliant movie. Um, I don't think that, that was but there was some early resistance. But I haven't heard of any resistance. I've, there's a lot of interest. Now that, I, you just, well, now that you just had the one come out on Paramount about uh, The Godfather and the, what happened. Right, the offer. There, right. The offer. Yeah. That's when movies get helped, when movies like that became very popular. Uh, and it, it actually had a lot of accuracy to it. Yes. Um, which I liked yeah. I enjoyed about it. Yeah, um, there was a movie. Uh, there was. My understanding was that they were trying to – maybe make a movie in the nineties, right? About Sonny's life. And yes. I know Tina was involved. Can you tell us about what happened there? Why it didn't get made and all of that? Well, Tina, there, there was actually a, a, a treatment uh, um, that was done by a couple of journalists. They were going to make a movie of Sonny's life because that was after he had been convicted of the bank robbery conspiracy. That was before even uh, John testified against him. And there was, there was it was it there was the real serious interest and Tina called a producer and demanded fifty thousand dollars. She mm -hmm. wanted to be paid, and she also wanted creative control. And they didn't want anything to do with her having creative control. But they were so. A friend of the producer called Sonny in prison, and he said she wants fifty thousand dollars. And he said, "Well, you know, she's crazy, but she ain't wrong. You know, she should get mm -hmm. the money. Sonny would never turn down money." Right. And so she uh, shook down the producer, but the movie never got made. And it, and in large part, they did because they did not want to deal with Tina, who could be extremely demanding and difficult. But she did get the fifty thousand, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, a good. They should make a movie about her getting the fifty thousand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> God bless her if, yeah. if she was able to do that. But she spent. Yeah. You know, she was good. She caught people out of money and a lot of people, but she spent it all. Mm. Was she? If, if she wasn't around, say her husband was in prison, and someone started talking bad about her husband, was she the type to defend him? Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. 
Yes. So she was, she, there was really like a love there. It might be, may have become a sick love at one point, but yeah. there was a love, a lot of love. Oh there. yeah. He was absolutely the love of her life. And, and you now he's the father of her children. And now I'm going to get into a little subject that might be a little bit tougher The sons. We have two sons here that uh, played major parts or they claim they make played major parts. Uh, you got a successful son uh, with his show and, uh, you know, YouTube, he has over a million uh, subscribers. And uh, then you have the son that ratted on him and put him in prison. Out of those two sons, who do you feel he was closer to? Oh, uh, he's the one who ratted on him, John Jr. John Jr. Mm -hmm. was the favorite by far, by far. And what was the feeling that you, and, and like I said, you don't have to go, you could say, what, stop it wherever you want in this. Uh, how do you feel like his lunch, his uh, relationship was with uh, Michael? Well, I asked him about his relationship with Michael and he said, look, you know, I, I got no complaints. I, he's a good son. Yeah, yeah, I can't complain about him. But, you know, even and he's a smart boy, but even smart people can do dumb things. Mm. And so he thought Michael did dumb things uh, like. In, during the um, 1990s, there was a gas tax scam that was run mm -hmm. by the mafia, the Italian and Russian mafias, and they made millions. And Michael lived very, very large. He had, yeah. you know, a mansion and boats and a plane. And uh, Sonny thought he was he was being too ostentatious and that he was attracting too much attention. And Sonny was right. He Sonny also thought he wasn't giving him enough money. And Tina. Yeah kept on bugging him because she wanted that money too. And mm -hmm. that was one thing that Michael, he did not share the money with his family. Even at the very end, he was mm. not giving his father any money. Now, when you hear Michael kind of try to make his relationship with his dad, maybe better than what it is, what it was. Uh, what do you think when you hear him say things like, uh, I always heard when he went to visit his father, he made sure he bought a camera crew. Is that true? No, no, he would videotape it. He'd have someone have a phone, you know, take a phone video. There wasn't always a full camera crew, but he, yeah, he would videotape. What it. I meant by that is like modern day. Was he filming it when he ever? Yeah, it? yeah, he did. He did. He did. Okay. John did not. When John visited him, he did not. So do you? Yeah. Hear do, I'm, I'm sorry, James. Uh, I'm kind of being a hog here. Ask the question. No, no, go ahead. Did you feel like? Uh, John has a lot of regrets because uh, John, you said something in the beginning of this that really kind of teed me off what John said. John told his father, it wasn't about you, dad. It was about the life. Please. <laughs> it's like, come on, dude. No, no. I'm sorry. I hope that, you said that to your father who's a gangster. He, he, he must have been thinking in his head, you're full of crap <laughs> no, you, about the life. Well, he does. No, he says that all the time. And, I, I think that's John's way of rationalizing what he did. Yeah. You asked me at one point before this, before we were doing this on the phone, you said, do you, did John ever express guilt about testifying against his father? He never did. But at one point you could, when I was talking to him, tears came to his eyes when he talked about mm -hmm. being a rat and saying, well, rats help people. Cause you know, you, you, if someone's abusing drugs and you rat them out, you're saving their lives. And, and so but he definitely felt some guilt. And, and he always says, I wasn't testifying against my father. I was testifying against the life. That's his rationalization. So and I he said that to his, his father. And his father said, well, you're my son. You've always been crazy. But you're my son and I love you. Well, yeah. I would think that maybe he, maybe he needs to say, I ratted on you because I wanted to get out of getting in trouble. Instead of saying it was about the life. Because, you know, I deal with well, a lot of these people that turn evident, I deal with them all the time. They do not like my show. Uh, I can tell you, I get threats all the time, physical threats. And uh, it's be, it's not because they're ratting. It's because of their excuses for it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I may rat. I don't know if I'm looking at 50 years, but, it, but what I make the excuses they make. And usually when they, when they uh, get pushed in a corner, 
they'll blame the person they ratted on. Yeah. Sammy yeah. Guevara yeah. is a perfect example about that. Yeah. He talks horrible about John Gotti and he couldn't carry John Gotti's shoes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this is what they do when they're online now. It's like they blame the victim. And I call these people victims because they're not only putting them away. I mean, to me, this whole thing about uh, going after your father when he, in his 90s, mm-hmm. it, it's a whole new level of, of, of mean. I don't know yeah. if, if, if I'm saying it wrong. I... Well, if you were to meet John, he is the sweetest guy. He's a great storyteller. He's a lot like his father. He's funny and bright and very, very charming. Yeah. Um, Do you um, know if, uh, so I know that obviously John was the favorite of Sonny and Tina, but uh, what caused him to go down this path with, with drugs? Uh, you know, I, you know, I know every, there's millions of families that deal with children that, get into drugs and so maybe it's nothing unique with with john but what caused this path of self-destruction that would lead him to putting a wire on and testifying against his father so what happened growing up well when when sonny went to prison that really hit john hard Mm -hmm. he um sonny went to prison in 1970 and john would have been about 10 years old yep And he said that's when he started to shut down because, you know, people in school, he went to a a school on Long Island, suburban Long Island, which is, you know, Mm -hmm. pretty, it's not a city. This is kind of soft suburban stuff. And people were talking about him and he, he started, he would started to close down. He um, got into fights. It was really, really hard on him. But when you, but the other thing John talks about is there was a genetic history in his family. A, a grandparent had a drinking problem. And we know that um, drug abuse and alcoholism, often there's a genetic component. And so John yeah. believed there was a genetic component. But, and John was also, he loved being the son of Sonny Francis. He loved um, the doors that had opened for him. But he really didn't like the violence, even though mm-hmm. in some ways he was he was tougher than Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, he didn't like the violence and he got hooked on crack cocaine. He got HIV, um, Mm -hmm. and from needles. Well, it's either needles or he did at times have sex with men for for money for drugs. So, okay. Yeah. That's another thing that's not in the book, but, um, (laughs) but, um, yeah. And he, I mean, he admits it. I don't want, mm-hmm. it, you know, uh, he admits it, but. Yeah, sure. Uh, and he and, seems uh, like a very fascinating guy to, to, to actually talk to. He yeah. is, he is. He's, he's very, very appealing. Um, and, you know, he's got sober. He, he um, helps in a sober, he helps out in a sober house. And I'm sure he's a real asset in those groups because he really gets it. And he understands addiction and he understands being sober. So he's yeah. he's accomplished that in his life, which is a big deal. Yeah. What about with Michael? Uh, one of the things that what and and Lee was touching on of what Michael of what how Michael uh, portrays his father now. But um, one of the things that he mentions now is he's not sure. He's thinking, well, yeah, Sonny may be really my father. You know, I you know. I wouldn't have gotten made if, uh, you know, cause they, they go through and look at my background and all that, but you know, his real father was Italian as well. So, uh, do you think Michael, uh, it, was he adopted? I know well, he was adopted, but wh- who's his blood father, I guess is why I was trying well, to say. He's, he's, I've asked him, he's never had a DNA test. Um, right. And he won't do it. No, no. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sonny, look, Sonny was his emotional father. I mean, Sonny was the guy yeah. who was there, but uh, he is the product of Tina's first marriage to Louis Grillo. Mm-hmm. And um, he tells a story in his second memoir. You know, he wrote one memoir and then he kind of, he wrote another one years later that he sort of revised and he kind of changed mm-hmm. some of the facts in it. Right. And he, he um, added an epilogue where he said, his mother told him that his real father was Sonny Francis. John told that story. 
disputes it. And he said, look, I was there when that happened. And she said, I'll fix him. And she just said that to mess with his head. Tina mm. could be very abusive emotionally, physically, verbally. Mm -hmm. And um, so John doesn't think it's true. But of course, John is is the blood son of Santa yes. Francis, and that's his claim to fame. And so maybe he doesn't want he does have an older brother, Carmine, but Carmine's not in the life, you know, and Carmine right. doesn't want to be part of that. He doesn't want to talk about that. Um, so it might be rivalry, but John, who and and I will say this, um, uh, as far as I know, John has never lied to me. Michael, he he's he's shaded the facts a little bit and i tell you about michael that you have to here's my observation he is very very technical so when what i mean by that is he will say when when the when they question him for ratting he'll say well i have never put away any no one has spent a day in prison right because right. of my testimony but he neglects to say that yeah corby won't he uh, Norby Walters uh, did go to jail. He he was found that basically it was a technicality is a reason right. he didn't have prison. So you have to you have to listen and be careful of every single word that Michael says because he is very technical when it comes to what he says and calculated by his res responses, because this is his brand. You know, he looks at it as a business, a brand. So you have to watch what he says. Oh yeah. He's a very opinion. smart. You're, you're absolutely right. And he's a very yeah. smart, articulate guy and he's great yeah. when he gives sermons. He's great when he gives yeah. talks and, but, and he's, he's done it a lot. So he knows what he's doing. Is he, yeah. will he try to, uh, jump in and uh, be part of a movie if there was a movie because uh, there's going to be some things going on there between both sons, I have the feeling. Well, you're right. You're right. Um, I'm sure he would. I'm, I'm sure he would try. Um, and I just don't know enough about that world to know whether I, whether he would be successful, but I'm sure he would try. And I know Michael um, has been trying to get a TV show made about his father for at least five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been pushing it. Um, and maybe he'll succeed. We'll see. What's the relationship of the boys now? I mean, are they talking now? Because Michael has said that not, I'm not sure if they reconcile, but he said that they do talk from time to time. So it's not like they're totally estranged. But do you know what that relationship is at this point? There, There's a genuine love and affection between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And John lives in Indianapolis and he was very disturbed when he found out that Michael had visited Indianapolis a couple of times and hadn't reached out to him. Mm. Um, and I, I think his feeling is Michael doesn't want to um, give him any money because John lives in very reduced circumstances. John is mm. not living large at all. When he left witness protection, he lost a lot of money. Yeah. And so he he does get government benefits, ironically, because he didn't pay a lot of taxes in his life. But but he does not he does not have um, a lot. He lives in mm. very reduced circumstances. Michael, on the other hand, is a very wealthy man. And so I think there's a lot of hurt there. Mm -hmm. I I don't I don't see anger. They, they really do love each other. But I I don't see, I, I, I mean, I know, because the last time I talked to John, they don't really talk to each other. Mm. And it's, so there's a sadness, but it's not out of a specific anger. I think it's just where they are in their lives. Yeah. Now let's, with Tina, how was, uh, now what year did Tina pass? You know, I, I was going to look that up. I think it's it was, 2012. I think. Yeah, I was, I was just yeah. about to say it was 2012. Thank you, James, for reading the book last night. <laughs> remembering that. I, I was going to say 2012. Yeah. And at that time, what was her relationship with her husband? And uh, did she, when she passed, I mean, was she in bad, dire straits? I mean, 
what happened she, there. She was estranged from Sonny, uh, and she had gone through all their money. He was he didn't wasn't giving her any more money, and so she was essentially homeless. She was living in her car with her two dogs, mm. and she called up her former daughter in law Roberta and said, "Can I come and live in your house because I have no place else to go?" And Roberta said yes. And she, but at that point she had breast cancer mm -hmm. and she also later had a stroke, which is ultimately, I think what killed her. She, she went to hospice after the stroke and um, she, she, Roberta truly loved Tina, but uh, Tina was in really bad health and all alone in her final days. And when she was in hospice, some of the guys in the crew went to visit her. Michael never did. And John didn't because he was in witness protection. Mm. And the guys in the crew were pretty upset that Michael never visited her. And one of them who has since died said that she was uncomfortable with the visit because she was no longer beautiful. She had, was emaciated mm. from the cancer and, you know, smoking mm. and all that. And um, it, so it was a sad, lonely ending for her. Well, he was kind of like that with his father, too, at the end. He didn't go mm -hmm. to his funeral, right? Mm -hmm. And no. so I just don't understand that. I mean, he doesn't seem to think that there's threats on his life still. I mean. Oh, no, there know. are threats on his life. And he, no, 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 yeah. there are. He, I watched him give a sermon on Long Island and I was interviewing him beforehand. And he was very nervously looking out the window. He was worried. He is, he is worried about threats in his life. Yeah. But, but bear in mind, Michael did not have a good relationship with his mother. She was a volatile, abusive person. And yeah. whenever he talks about her, he said, you know, she's my mother. I love her. But he, yeah. he did not, um, you know, I, and, and she was not good to his wife. Um, mm. So he either one, right? Well, no, he liked Marie. it. She liked his first wife, but she Maria, did not like yeah. his, his second wife. And yeah. John um, had a better relationship with Tina because he was the favorite and they were secretly speaking while he was in witness protection. And um, he was a real source of comfort to her. So he was the one who was closest to her. Right. But I think for Michael, you know, he feels a lot of anger about he said, look, my, my mother was not was abusive, but it made me tough. It toughened me up. But I think on some level he has some real anger about that. Mm. Yeah. And when you uh, have, did, have you ever got had an opportunity to ever speak to her before she passed away? Or no, 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 because she died in 2012. I didn't even know um, about Sunny until 2017. So, um, so, and I'm sad because. Uh, I find her to be a fascinating character and I definitely would have. And, it, and it's this incredible love story between two mm. people. She met him when she was 16 years old. Yeah. And so she lived her whole life with him. So when you think about her, you think about this uh, tough, beautiful woman that kind of tamed a very, well, tamed the best she could, a very wild mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Yeah. And he did. He loved her till the very end. He said, you know, she knew how to, she had class. And I asked him about her and he said she had class. She mm. knew how to walk. She knew how to talk. She knew how to do every goddamn thing. He just, mm -hmm. to the end, he loved her. So he loved her yeah. even toward the end oh. of his life. Yeah. But even though he said, you know, I figured God wouldn't take her and the devil wouldn't take her either. You know, <laughs> I mean, he, he said yeah. she was tough, but he did yeah. love her. And where were you when he passed, when Sonny passed? I mean, do you... I, I was, you know, I, I had seen him maybe a week before he died because he invited me to his 103rd birthday, although he was trying to claim it was his 104th birthday. Yeah. And um, he looked pale to me. And this was in mm. February of 2020. And about a week later, I got the call. I was in the office and he died. And his family mm. told me, now bear in mind, this is right before the pandemic. He, mm -hmm. um, his family said, the doctor said it was a new kind of flu that killed him. And mm. looking back, I think he probably died of COVID. He was in a nursing home. He was mm. in a New York nursing home, wasn't he? he? Right, right. Yeah. And so I Awful. think it was probably COVID. Wow. Yeah, but yeah. no one knew about it. No one knew it at the time because it was a, a few weeks later yeah. that we all shut down. Do you know yeah. if a lot of people went to his funeral? 
It was a small gathering. It was maybe 70 to 75 people. I heard from some, some guys that uh, they were told to stay away. Um, he did have a large family. So he had a lot of family members there. There was a gospel choir because, you know, he was, he promoted a lot of black singers in his career. Um, and it was a nice event. Um, but and but it wasn't you know John Gotti if you remember his funeral there were all sorts oh, of yeah. elaborate floral displays which I love yeah. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. I always tell people when I die I want lots of flowers you know mm -hmm. but um, Sonny's was far more understated. It's funny you so, said that I, I was yeah. on Angel, I was on Angel Gotti's show last night and I was talking to her about her uh, her father's funeral and I and I accidentally said prayed <laughs> and she <laughs> said it was not a prayed. <laughs> well, she's right, but but you know he got he got a big he got a good send off, John Gotti. But so did mm -hmm. Sonny. You know, everybody's different; they do it in their own yeah. way. Yeah, I wanted to ask. Uh, you know, so we're talking about the, you know, the last days of of Sonny, and so there's two people in particular on social media that use Sonny's name and say they were close to him. And so I'd really like to know your thoughts on these two people in particular. So we have. Ori Spado, that calls himself a lifelong friend of Sonny's and has gone on uh, Vlad TV, believe, and others saying how he was close to uh, Sonny and even said, I guess they had a disagreement at, at times, but then they got back together, but saying that he was this close friend. And then you got a guy named Greg Vita, who's who's been on a few shows where he's saying he was childhood friends with, I believe, Sonny's daughter, uh, Gia. Um, Gia. Gia. Yeah. Yep. And so he's claiming that he's one of the only people to visit him and take him out to eat and all that. So uh, what are your thoughts of the stories of Ori Spado and Greg Vita? Is it true or not? Well, Ori, um, Ori definitely, you know, he did business with Sonny um, in terms of how close they were. I think Ori's uh, recollection of that relationship has grown over time. And yeah, like they in, all do. All and, these guys. <laughs> and in fact, you know, they were having dinner one time in New York City at mm -hmm. um, Lorraine, at the, the restaurant of Sonny's son-in-law. And Sonny whispered something to the um, restaurant owner and the, the dish came out. And it was a seafood dish. And mm. Son Ori was, he's allergic to seafood. And Sonny mm. knew that. And he had to, Sonny had a couple guys take him to the hospital. Oh, but, wow. Um, so Ori nearly, nearly died. And yeah. the story on among the around the family is, oh, no, he couldn't stand Ori. That's why he did that. Yeah. And it's sure <laughs> he was served seafood. Now, Ori... Uh, saw that story in the book, he said, well, we're friends. We were friends. And, you know, he, he believes very strongly that they were good friends, but the family doesn't view it that way. In but terms the, of the fact of the matter is though, Ori actually did know him. So he's not. Oh yes, he did. That. He did. Okay. Absolutely. And um, how close they were, I don't know, but Sonny used to say to me, a lot of guys use my name, you know, and he didn't mind mm -hmm. as long as he got money out of it. You know, he didn't <laughs> mind people yeah. using his name. So well, that's good to know what Ori, because they're all telling tales, but so we know that Ori did know him. Yes. But just yes. wasn't, probably didn't have the relationship he's saying. Okay. And that's pretty much it with Ori, would you say? I, yeah, I think so. I think so. And um, in terms of Greg Vita, I know the family got upset with the videos that he was posting about the nursing home because, and they told people not to talk to him. Um, Sonny had a stream of visitors at the nursing home. People were taking him out to lunch and dinner all the time. He even said, oh, it's too much. You know, Sonny mm. was a popular guy. Uh, and when I went to his, his last birthday uh, celebration, his niece and nephew were already there and they invited me to stay. And I said, you know, I don't really want to impose on a birthday celebration, but the whole family was coming over, but he had a lot of people who wanted to um, take him out and give him a little money in the nursing home. He was, so he, he was wasn't not alone. Sitting, he wasn't sitting there alone being totally ignored. No, but he did hate the nursing home. He no hated worries. it. He wanted to go home. 
No one is in his family was willing or able to take him home. Mm. But Sonny wasn't a complainer. You know, that's one of the things that I, I found so amazing about him at over a hundred years old. He had this remarkable zest for life and mm. he, he was tickled pink to be out of prison. He hated the nursing home, but he was thrilled. He was out of prison, you know, yeah. so he, he knew how to put things in perspective. Yeah. Now, James, we're going to, uh, we're getting close to the end of this interview. What question would you think that you would like to ask Sandra while you have her here that you may not get the chance to ask again? Yeah. So shoot, there, there's so many, but I know that. I'm um, one. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, you know, once, uh, what about two? So one. Uh, <laughs> oh, go for it. All right. So up, first one is, and they're, they're not even related, but. Um, so what was uh, Saint's relationship with um, with Andrew Musk Russo? Because he was the um, acting boss and Sonny was an underboss. So I didn't see too much mention. We know that uh, Russo was the um, was a relative of Carmine Persico. So I'm curious about that relationship uh, because that would be kind of his last boss of the Columbos that he dealt with. And so uh, but then. Why do you think Sonny became more careless over time? So you see in the 60s where he wouldn't even he wouldn't talk about anything, even in his house, about the life. And then later on in life, you know, obviously, I know his son, that's probably part of the reason. But he gets caught on tape multiple times and he gets violated multiple times. So I call it a little bit of carelessness. So those are the two questions I have. Why do you think Sonny became more careless over time and then the relationship with with uh, Russo? I think he, he respected Russo. You know, Sonny respected the hierarchy of the mafia. Mm -hmm. At one point in prison, there was real tension between him and Carmine Persco because I think he believed Persco had ordered a hit on John and yeah. he wanted to hurt Persco. He was ready to pull out a knife and Russo stopped it. Mm -hmm. Russo stepped in and stopped it. So I think he had a lot of respect because, you know, if Sonny wanted to do something, nobody stopped him. And so mm. I think he had a lot of respect for Russo in yeah. terms of the carelessness, I think with John. And again, he didn't really say a whole lot on tape with John. He said a couple mm -hmm. of things, but it was only and which were incriminating, but it was only because John was kind of pushing him. Um, the person who really got a lot of stuff, on, more incriminating stuff on tape with him was Guy Fatato. Yes. And um Guy Fatato was paying him money that was coming from the FBI. And uh, explain so who think, Guy, and, and can you explain who Guy Fatato was? Guy Fatato was a guy he met in prison who became an informant for the FBI and he wore a wire and when Sonny was in his 90s and he had a club um and so Sonny would come to the club and you know every week or so he would give Sonny an envelope of money that was coming from the FBI. And I think the money um, softened Sonny up, but, mm. you know, in his nineties and, you know, bear in mind, he was always, always very cautious. He didn't get caught by his son until he was mm. in his late eighties, but in his nineties, I think he, he, one of the things he used to talk to Guy Fatato a lot about was the life. He was kind of mm. mentoring him. And I felt like he wanted to pass on some of his wisdom to a younger guy who he th saw uh, as an up and comer. Right. And I, I think that's the reason he talked to me. He knew he wasn't going to be around for very long. Mm. And he knew that he had a real, some history to share that he wanted mm. shared. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I just want to put something up here real quick so people would know. How is your, how's the book still, is the book still moving pretty good? Yeah, it is. It's a year out. It's a, it's a, it's a top seller on Kindle. It's always in the top uh, four or five for sales of organized crime biographies. It was a number one Amazon bestseller. It went into a second printing before it came out. So I'm kind of amazed, <laughs> frankly, because it's been out for a year and uh, people are still buying it. So I'm thrilled I, and I hope you guys get more people to read it because yes. I, I think it's an important story. He embodied the rise of the American mafia. He was a unique character. And as Lee told me before, you know, I haven't found my next book. Mm -hmm. And Lee made what I thought was a very perceptive comment. He said, well, but that's because you haven't found another Sonny. Mm. You know, 
I, I it, think that's a good point. It's like, how can you? I mean, you got him, but he's a he's an actor. You know, it's like uh, it's Grillo. That's it. But he's an actor. You know, you're not going to find anybody like him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, Is know, there other ways to reach reach you besides, um, you know, obviously on, on Amazon, but how else can people reach you? Well, I have a website. If you look up uh, author, Sandra Petty author or SJ Petty author, because the name on the book is SJ Petty. My editor yeah. was concerned about um, a mob book written by a woman, that people wouldn't buy <laughs> yeah. a mob book written by a woman. Yeah. So you can look for my website where I, I have upcoming talks and I'll put this video on there. Uh, people can also get me at Gmail, sander.petty at gmail.com, and I'm happy to respond. And, so, I, yeah. you know, that's where I, I want to close this. First of all, I'd like to thank you for doing this. Thank uh, you. The the knowledge, you actually brought uh, Sonny back to life. Um, because, you know, it's like you're here talking, you bring him back to life. You give me an idea about his son, John. Uh, we all know about Mike, but John is like that figure that, Everybody calls a rat. They don't really know about him. And, uh, you know, he's fighting addiction. Uh, and he's sober right now. My Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's sober. He's sober. Well, let's let's bless him and hope that, that he yeah. can stay sober. I mean, that's the most important thing. And I didn't come here to bash the son. That's all between the fathers and the sons. We're just trying to put facts out here. But um, here's the question I want to. S.J. Petty. And this is what I found fascinating. Um, you're a woman that wrote a mob book. Um, do you believe if you put your regular name on this book that it would have sold as well? No. Hmm. No. And why do you say that? Well, there's a core audience for this kind of book. And, and I don't think that they think a woman could understand the life. And um, I know that. I mean, I know a lot of these guys think that I couldn't understand the life. But... I, I'm hoping just that the the fullness of the story goes beyond the core audience. Like I don't yeah. consider you guys hardcore mob buffs. No. And trust me, I, I know right. a lot of hardcore no. mob buffs. You're you're sort of more in the civilian world. You're kind of beyond that. Yeah. And um, you seem to have liked the book, but I, I'm hoping that the full story will get us a, a bigger audience. And it's not whether I'm a man or a woman, it's the story. And just judge for yourself. Don't judge yeah. me, judge whether or not you believe it. And everything, in, and I did, in fact, uh, footnote every single line. <laughs> yep. It added 30 pages to the page count. And my editor wow. said, to me, you're throwing off the page count. Can we, so I condensed it to a couple of pages of chapter notes. Um, and that's why I don't have every, every line, but I can I can footnote every line. And when you wrote the book, is there anything that the lawyers made you take out? No. And, you know, I'm an investigative reporter, so I'm used to dealing with lawyers, vetting my stories. So I'm pretty careful about that kind of stuff. And it, the thing, the other thing is mobsters don't sue <laughs> typically, <laughs> but you have to worry about the ancillary characters who might not mm -hmm. want to be associated uh, with it. Um, but no, I didn't have to take anything out. Yeah. What are you doing next? So I know that you're uh, looking for your next project, but what's going on in your life now? I, I'm assuming you still do stuff with Newsday, or are you still involved with them, or what? What are you doing? I'm, right you know, now? I'm, do I'm doing a variety of stories. I may do something um, on the paranormal, some paranormal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I just did a big story about. I like true crime too. I'm kind of interested mm -hmm. in that. So I right. did a story about how a dead woman's cell phone led to eight different prosecutions and wow. how that happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm interested in doing something along those lines. You know, when you write a book, you're living with it for a long time. So it's got to mm -hmm. be something that you um, enjoy. Yeah. Are you considered an independent writer that writes for, uh, or do you actually work for a certain? I'm on staff at Newsday. Oh, you are. But this book, it was a separate. It it wasn't a Newsday project. It's it's published by an independent publisher. It's not. Did the, the people at Newsday come to you and say, "Is there any way you can get something maybe like this uh, book that you just did with Sunny? You know, is there somebody out there that you can try to find that can give the same flair?" You know, I'm. I'm lucky. They give me a lot of room to sort of uh, seek out my own stories. And uh, 
and I pitch them to them and they say yes or no. So, uh, but it really, people always ask me, what's your favorite story? And I don't have a favorite because I always fall in love with the next one. So mm. I'm looking for the next book to fall in love with. It's going to be hard to fall out of love with, Sonny. I know. I know. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're right. going to do it. You're going to, you're, you're going to do it, Tina. I'm sorry. You're going to cry. <laughs> you know, even in death, Sonny has you. Uh, you know, Hooked. You, you're absolutely right. Once you walked in that room, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of funny. Did you have, what, can you imagine when you went, first met him? It's like you had no idea how revered this man is no. by, by civilians. And by the mob mobologists, let's say, or the mob mm -hmm. experts. And here's Well, I knew I knew he was respected. When I met him, I understood why. Yes. Did that way. He was Did you guy. ever do a book on a uh, a person that rats after dealing with somebody like Sonny? No. And John wow. has asked me. Mm. Uh, so no. Wow. Because the other day we were talking and I said the closest guy guy to this guy that I could think of that lived that lifestyle, that Hollywood lifestyle would be Chris Pacciello, but he was a rat. He ratted on a lot of people and he was involved with a woman getting shot in the face. Right. right. So I guess that, that you would have to actually go out and look for someone that, and now there's so many, there's so many informants that it'd be pretty hard to do. Yeah. Because yeah. they're dying out. The real yeah. guys mm -hmm. are dying they out. They are. They are. They are. Yeah. And if you want to go, like, like say uh, you decide that you wanted to go Tommy Vitera, but he is a serial killer that cut off a woman's head. So <laughs> how, how how do you deal with, you know, you, you know, it's like, uh, I got a feeling like you kind of put yourself in a hole right away because you did Sonny. And You're right. You're absolutely right. So that's the, that's the conundrum. So I don't know. We'll and find I like out. to say to the men out there, that you got out hustled by a woman. <laughs> uh, Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. I mean, they got out hustled because you had the fortitude to say, okay, this guy right here, I'm going to go after. I'm going to speak to this guy. And this is like what other people dream of doing. This would be my dream. If I had any, if I had a choice to sit down and talk to any mobster, there's two of them. It'd be him or John Gotti. If I could sit at a table yeah. for a, an hour. So you got to sit down at the table with this guy six times. Yeah. But Sandra, you know, but I think a lot of it too is, is, is a testament to you. And, you know, well, it you. might've been as a woman, you were able to soften him up a little bit, sunny up enough that he would be willing to, trust you and talk to you it didn't it it obviously helped that you brought him food but do you think other men that may not have been able to get That's that a good story point. you know well there there are men who know him who said he would have never said those things to a man he told me things he never told his family wow they learned things about him that they never knew that he told me wow well, you know That's what I'm all on you. You know, you did a great job. You well, know, I'm so you. impressed by what you did, and and it it's such a wonderful book. I mean, one of my favorite of all time, and so it's just an well, honor to be able to talk to you. Well, yeah. thank you for you both for such thoughtful and perceptive questions. Thank well, you so well, much. Well, I'm going to end this. If you could yep. stay here before, don't jump out yet, if you okay. don't mind, Sandra, for one okay. minute. I like to say thank you to everybody, and I'm going to ask this after an hour and a half, an hour. Please sub to the channel. Please hit like. I would really appreciate it. And uh, your information is going to be below this video, uh, just so that people, if people want to uh, somehow contact you. Is okay. that okay? Sure. sure. Okay. Okay, people. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, James. And thank especially you. thank you, Sandra, for, for doing this with us. Thank you both so much. Thank, thank you. you.